Jesus looked up to heaven. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill me with the word desperately needed to sustain life. And let me speak in the name of God, the Father and the Mother of us all. Amen. Let me state the obvious. I'm a geek. I'm a nerd. We knew this. If we've met, then you already know that. So it will not come as a surprise to you that I have a multitude of geeky nerd friends. Right? One of my friends, Matt Harbison, who is a youth minister in the Chattanooga area, is also an amateur astronomer. Now, I'm not talking about a $10 telescope from Target in his backyard. I'm like, he's into this. Thousands upon thousands of dollars he's invested in, in like, uh, telescopes that can see, I don't know, Andromeda and beyond or something, right? He's really up in it. Um, and his current area of exploration, however, is a little closer. It's the sun. He's really fascinated by the sun. In fact, he does live streams where he points a telescope at the sun with appropriate filters, and you can watch the activity on the surface of the sun in real time. He lets me write music for his live streams sometimes, so you really should uh, check those out. But um, this is one of his still shots. In the room, you're, you can see them over here. If you're watching on home, they're over my left shoulder. Um, but look at that. Look at that. It's the same sun. We don't have two. We just have one. We know this, right? But he's using two different filters to highlight different activity at different levels of the sun. The purple one is deeper into the sun than the orange one. Um, just look how amazing this piece of God's creation is. It's massive. Right? It's massive in size and it's massive in importance. Right? No sun, no life on earth. I think that's important. <laughs> I think it's very important. Right? The sun puts out hundreds of septillion watts of energy every second. Every second. It's massive. Yet, in the vast expanse of interstellar space, our sun is, well, average. There are bigger stars, there are smaller stars, and ours are kind of, our sun's kind of Anglican, it's in the middle. <laughs> Thank you for getting that joke. We have a growing understanding of the vastness of the universe. The overwhelming size of God's cosmos. However, folks in Jesus' day had a much different view of what lies beyond the sky. While we think of space as the medium where stars, planets, moons, and asteroids travel in curves and orbits in three dimensions, back in the day, People thought of the land, the, literally, the land beyond the sky as heaven, literally the dwelling place of God. In our gospel proclamation today, Jesus looks up to heaven to offer his final prayer before his ascension. When it says Jesus looked up to heaven to his disciples, Jesus was literally looking toward the throne of God. With our modern and more accurate understanding of what's outside our atmosphere, it's really hard for us to view the ascension the same way as the disciples. In fact, I'm not sure that it's helpful to even try. It's more helpful for us to envision Jesus looking not to a physical space, rather beyond beyond the limits of what we can perceive and beyond the limits of creation. 
Rebecca, Rebecca Blair Young puts it this way. The biblical view of heaven is different from our view of the universe. Where our ancestors looked up and imagined a heavenly dwelling for the divine, we see physical space extending billions of light years. Even in the age of science, though, it remains significant that Jesus looks up at this moment because he is looking beyond worldly limits to a far greater unlimited life. Unlimited life. <clears throat> that sounds cool. It sounds more than cool. That sounds awesome. Sign me up for that. But what do we as Christians mean by unlimited life? For us, unlimited life is growing into the full stature of Christ. The one who loved as completely as God loves. The one who was and is and will always be one with God. The one who invites us to be one with God as well. Today we heard two versions of the ascension. One from Acts, one from John. And it's helpful for us to think of the ascension of Jesus metaphorically as well. Instead of thinking of Jesus floating off into the sky like in some production of Jesus Christ Superstar, Reverend Broderick Greer suggests we think of Jesus being swallowed, swallowed by love. I love this metaphor for Jesus' ascension and the ministry of Jesus' church in the world. The ascension of Jesus in the text points us to the coming of the Holy Spirit, which we celebrate next week. Celebrating the ascension and Pentecost in worship points us toward the ministry of the church and the world. The Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney writes, writes this about the ascension. God's plan was to gift the same power by which Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven to the followers of Jesus, to bathe us in it, in a holy fire of baptism that will burn within us, but not destroy us. God's plan is that we be in communion with God and each other, fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit to love as God loves. The ascension is a sign pointing towards what is to come. The church, God's body on earth, will be filled with the Holy Spirit, the love of God incarnate in Jesus, and the world will never be the same. The world will never be the same. Now, that might be a little overwhelming. Scary, even. Indeed, the ascension can seem really scary. I mean, Jesus just up and leaves the disciples to it. The Romans are still after them. It's still an unsafe world around them. The church isn't even off the ground yet. Yet Jesus gets on up out of here like he's got somewhere better to be. That could be scary. Unless we remember two things. First, the ascension is kind of like graduation day for the disciples. In just a moment, we're going to honor graduates today. And I, I think the ascension is kind of like a graduation day. Remember earlier uh, in the ministry of Jesus when he sends out the 72 to do uh, ministry in other places that he couldn't get to? He gives the, the disciples like, like instructions, right? He tells them what they can carry, what they shouldn't carry. He tells them where to go. He tells them who to stay with, who not to stay with. It's like, like yesterday, my kids uh, went on a band trip uh, to, to uh, not Cedar Point, Kings Island. Yes, I know where my kids went. <laughs> I do know they, 
But the school sent us a, a, like a, an, an hour by hour itinerary. I wasn't even going on the trip and they sent it to me, right? This time with the ascension, Jesus doesn't give instructions. He doesn't give them a packing list. He doesn't give them an itinerary. He says, go. Love people the way I have. Go to all the world and love them. The ascension is a lot like graduation day. Because the disciples can't continue to grow. Can't become what God intends. Can't do the ministry that God needs them to do if they stay physically attached to Jesus. It's time for them to no longer be dependent upon the physical Jesus. It's time for them to stand on their own two feet. It's time to graduate. The second thing to remember is the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's presence with us, not just to support, but to empower. And oh my goodness, what a power it is. The Apostle Paul writes that God's power, the Holy Spirit, working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Infinitely more. More than the power of the Son. My brothers, my sisters, my non-binary family as well. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we experience the real presence of Christ at this altar and are swallowed up in God's love so that we can go. We are fed so that we can do the work God has given us to do. It's a mini ascension day, a mini graduation day, whenever we come to this altar. Around this table, we graduate from being disciples, those that follow, to becoming apostles, those that are sent to spread the good news. So come and feast, my dear siblings. Then go and spread the word. Amen. Amen. Amen.